uh, we are here with Jonathan Tweet. Jonathan is an American game designer. He was involved in Ars Magica, Talislanta, Over the Edge, Everway, D&D. We're going to talk a lot about D&D today. 13th Age, among many other projects, and he's going to talk about uh, that with us uh, some more. Um, some few tidbits of information for anyone that doesn't know Jonathan. Ars Magica. Magica, for example, is considered by many to be one of the first truly narrative focused games, highly recommended by us. Uh, Over the Edge was one of the first role playing games that it introduced the concept of freeform attributes or tags for characters, a concept that perhaps you know uh, if you are watching this from games like Fate, they interpreted, they adapted these things in their games. Uh, some sources like uh, uh, Shannon Apple Klein's book uh, Designers and Dragons credit uh, Jonathan as the person that helped popularize or even invented, we are going to talk about that one of the core mechanics of uh, a role plus a bonus that was very important in Ars Magica and it's fundamental to the way all editions of D&D after 3.0 work so, first of all Jonathan, thank you for being here we are here with Leon from Taberna de Roll with Puel, Elbardo del Day Day in Instagram, and with me, Fede from Tomate 20. This is our Notice y Dragones, News and Dragons in English, our segment <laughs> of news about role playing games uh, that we do over here in Argentina for all the Spanish speaking uh, people. So, uh, just to break the, the ice, uh, a, a small um, question about the harshest. Topic. <laughs> you started, uh, uh, Jonathan. You started working at Wizards of the Coast as a freelancer, if I am correct. Uh, That's right. Uh, working on Talislanta, is that is that right? That was the, that's your right. First, um, and the company, Wizards of the Coast, was just starting as a company, as a role playing right. game uh, company. How how was that? How did you come to work for them? How did you uh, come in contact yeah. with the Wizards of the Coast at that time? Yeah, um, so I was across the country, uh, thousands of miles away, um, but luckily I had a contact there, Lisa Stevens. So she was, you know, the third partner in uh, Ars Magica. Uh, Mark Reinhagen and I were the designers of the game, but we couldn't have done it without Lisa Stevens. Um, she really helped us in a, a lot of ways, and she helped Wizards of the Coast in a lot of ways when they were just starting. Um, and one of the things that she did for them is get them in touch with freelancers like me and so um you know she's been around a long time she's done a bunch of great things and putting me in touch with wizards of the coast was was one of those great things all right she's now the head of paiso if i'm not mistaken yes she's... that's right i think she's retired but um uh but yes and are you still in touch with lisa uh, uh you know not much not much all right so what was it like working there when you were a freelancer? What was it like working with Wizards? Did you work uh, by mail? Did you work uh, in person? Did you have to move to work as a freelancer? Or how did that work? Uh, so we worked over uh, email, and um, which was uh, sort of new at that time, around uh, 1990. And uh, Wizards of the Coast was impressive because um, like right out of the gate, they had a number of people working on them, and they had a number of lines that they were working on, and um, you know they had an editor, which lots of small game companies don't have. So um, what I learned later is that Peter Atkinson had uh, raised funds from uh, people at Boeing. So the the air ma airplane manufacturers, Boeing. They used to be the big draw at Seattle. They would draw in smart people and engineers. And now, you know, it's Microsoft and Amazon. Um, but uh, that's how Peter uh, got involved there. And that's where he found his starting funds. And to his credit, he had a vision of, of success right from the start. So when Mark Reinhagen and I started uh, Lion Rampant to produce Ars Magica and um, Whimsy Cards and um, we we did it all, you know, uh, on the cheap. We tried to do it as as cheaply as possible. In fact, right. to to make laser prints 
um, we got into Lisa Stevens' father's office at night after hours <laughs> and used his office's laser printer because otherwise it would have cost us too much. Um, so that's an example of how cheap we were and how much Lisa helped us. Um, but Wizards of the Coast had funding and they had a vision and um, uh, and I could sort of tell that uh, right from the start. Yeah, wow, that's that's quite a story. <laughs> well, we we understand that some years after that, in June uh, 94, you were hired as a full time employee. That's right. In Wizards of the Coast. That's right. So, um, you know, they did that uh, change things. It changed. Yeah, it changed a lot. So. Um, so, you know, once they released magic, they started um, making lots of money and um, and they had trouble keeping up with it. Uh, you know, um, I actually interviewed there in 1993. That's my official date of hire. And I moved out there in uh, June of 94. Oh, and um, yeah. And um, so they were so busy working on magic that they they didn't have time to keep doing role playing games. <laughs> so they needed to hire more people to come and keep working on role playing games. And that was me. And so, <laughs> yeah. And and um, I I brought them a uh, two game concepts uh, that I could uh, start with. Uh, one was like a modern martial arts, you know, street fighting game. And uh, another was Everway. And they loved Everway. Um, and so when I, I was already uh, developing and play testing every way by the time uh, I moved out there. And, um, yeah. you know, it, it was, uh, it was strange to be doing role playing games at a company that was making a huge amount of money on trading card games. Yeah. Um, and, and it never really worked out that well. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, the, the focus and, was yeah. in, in other place. Like, yeah, their focus was on making money. And yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> like well that's not uh, strange like we have that's, recent that's right. <laughs> reminders of that that's right that, that uh, was smart uh, one little yeah. thing did you knew did you know someone then that still works at Wotsi like or in the DD studio I don't need names but yeah, uh, yeah I still I, in touch? I do I, that's you right I know I I'm not really in touch with people. Maybe I see them at conventions or we yeah. see each other online. Um, uh, Peter Atkinson and I are friends, but he left Wizards before I did. Yeah. Uh, he's He is uh, one of my main contacts there. And then uh, John Tynes. Um, so he was the first person that I hired at Wizards of the Coast to work at role-playing games. And in fact, he arrived at the office before I did because I was waiting... Um, I was married to a college professor and I had to wait for her year in school to be done before I could uh, move out to Seattle. And so, um, so John was at Wizards of the Coast back in the day. We're old friends and um, we knew each other before that, obviously. And he's back at Wizards of the Coast uh, running their uh, video games. So, uh, yeah, I know him. Yeah. It's a small. It's a small industry. <laughs> yes. yeah, I know that. That that's why I asked. Like, it wouldn't be strange. It's not strange. That's right. So I don't know anyone. I don't know any of the managers or the CEO or those people. That's not. <laughs> those are other whole kinds different worlds. <laughs> that's other another <laughs> thing. <laughs> that's yeah, another right. layer of hell. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, not my layer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in '94, you were hired. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And magic was booming. Yes. Sometime later, Wizards decided to close the RPG department. That's right. What happened there? Well, <laughs> <laughs> so so they were making so much money that they didn't have to count it. <laughs> <laughs> What's this? They, they need the space and, to store the money. No, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so like we we had a full time librarian to handle the the game library, 
uh, and she labeled the, you know, put labels on the spines of all the games and knew where all the games. But well, we didn't need a full time librarian. We had a we had a studio that was devoted to creating um, video shorts. Well, we weren't there were, we weren't making money on videos, and but that's what people wanted to do. So there's a like an Ice Age video of you know from Ice. 1995. I remember of, those. Okay, all right. So <laughs> someone saw them. Um, <laughs> so in, in, in 1995, uh, Wizards did their first uh, complete top to bottom profit and loss. Where's all the money coming in and where's all the money going out? <laughs> and then within a few months, there were massive layoffs. <laughs> huge cuts. So <laughs> I think, you know, reality, reality caught up with us. So... so um, Following that and, question, and, yeah. Um, yeah, in that moment, do you guys do you guys see the storm coming, like, or, or it was a, like a surprise? Uh, you know, it it was a surprise uh, oh. because we were making so much money, <laughs> right? And and so if if we have enough money to have a librarian and we have enough money to to have a, a video production studio, well. Yeah, we we must be doing great. Uh, yeah, it was a it was a it was a shock. So, um, and and Wizards had been really sort of a family, maybe too much of a family. Um, and the the first time somebody was laid off, uh, that was I think in '94, and that was someone who just would not do their job. Just just they were in shipping and they just wouldn't work. And so they they were let go, and it was announced at the all hands meeting because oh. what oh what a oh no someone in our family is no longer with us so that was the that was the vibe and so you can imagine what a shock it was to have you know a, a large portion of the staff let go all at once and lines cut and yeah it was it, it, it was a shocker. Uh, one thing it's like in that time. Did you feel the the Watsi uh, family like a small business, or it was already great, uh, pretty great? Bah, I don't know, but I'm, it was a small business feeling from from. Uh, it, I mean, it had obviously grown too big, but there was we there was still sort of there were aspects of it that were still sort of small company, personal company kind of family company um the the two people who ran it were peter and his wife um and and so you know but it, it was obviously it was too big uh to to sustain that um would have all hands meetings where anybody could ask a question of the president you know and that's fine when you have 30 people but when you have 300 people or 600 people it's it's uh Yeah, it did not scale up. It was it was a strange place to be, and we could we could tell that mistakes were being made, that things were going wrong. Um, you, you know, bad decisions with money were being made, but um, but it didn't. It, no, no one expected massive layoffs because it, because we were making so much money. <laughs> so. Then in 1997, Wizards of the Coast bought TSR and yeah. Dungeons and Dragons with it, which is That's like right. the defining moment for the Wizards of the Coast we know now. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about how the process came to be? Uh, when did you find out that this decision had been made? How were the negotiations? When uh, did Wizards start working on their own content for D&D? How, how was that process? Um, so I didn't see much of that that other people didn't see. I I, um, I was not in the loop, but um, I had heard on the rumor mill that that uh, maybe we were going to buy Dungeons and Dragons. So the what was happening was uh, for, for a whole bunch of stupid reasons, Dungeons and Dragons as a 
as a product line was failing. It was the most popular role-playing game ever, and it was failing because the people running it didn't understand games or gamers or or whatever it was, and and the and the people who did understand games and gamers, the designers, were not allowed to see the numbers, so they didn't know which products were profitable and by how much or whatever. So it was complete failure of uh, strategic planning. And so um, I think it was Ryan Dancy who sort of brokered this deal of, uh, and then he and his people also uh, were hired on to Wizards of the Coast at the same time, which was amazing because I don't know that we could have done third edition without Ryan Dancy uh, running that. And so the, the tricky part was the longer you wait to buy Dungeons and Dragons, the less it's worth because it, it was going down and down and down. So, but on the other hand, so you could buy it cheaper, but the brand would also be hurt more. Right. So, right, you want to buy it when it's hurting badly, but not dead or what? So anyway, um, uh, when we bought Dungeons and Dragons, the understanding was that we were going to do another edition. So Peter Atkinson was a huge D and D fan from the beginning. He had a giant campaign and a rule set that he called Super Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Um, super. And I, I, boy, I played in his campaign once, and it was super advanced. It was it it really was amazing. And, and, and he. Um, he's such a, you know, a networker and a visionary that not only did he have this uh, big campaign, but he sort of managed the nexus point of other people's campaigns in the area. And so players could move from one campaign to another and he coordinated wow. it. Yeah. Right. So he was he was built for great things one way or another. <laughs> So, uh, from the start, so he wanted, so he wanted to buy Dungeons and Dragons, and he wanted to do a new edition right. because, um, like most people, he was really disappointed with Second Edition. Second Edition was a great example of not understanding your game or gamers or what you're doing. Um, and so, when he bought Second Edition, he was almost insulted, like you're, you're making me buy this edition, and you haven't made it better in the ways that it needed to be made better and you've taken out cool things like monks and half orcs and assassins like what so uh so we knew we were going to do a new uh, edition right away wow so uh 1999 <laughs> 1999 <laughs> wizards was bought so uh, by hasbro yeah and also announced the third edition of the uh, so this is a continuation, but we know the the Hasbro yeah buying. How, how was this process? How was that process? Uh, sorry for the process. yeah. So um, uh, so lots of people at Wizards of the Coast had had stock. I had stock, um, and uh, many people were were paid in stock um, or they were paid in cash and stock and so uh, w we knew Wizards was making money we, we wanted at some point to make some money ourselves and um, there was no it was, because it was a small company um, it was hard to trade the stock and it was hard to know what it was worth and the first time that they estimated what it was worth it was 266 dollars and it had started at one dollar hmm. so so that was that was really something now yeah. um but the next year it was evaluated at 240 dollars so it had gone down and so now people are like oh no like is this what's going on is this gonna, this is going to be a mess right and so people had started to worry that the thing that they saw they were going to make a bunch of money on, they weren't going to make as much money on, or things were going to go south. And so in some ways, selling to Hasbro was a way of making sure, okay, now everyone with stock is going to get their money. You don't want to stock anymore, but you'll have, you'll be bought out for cash. And, um, and so I think a lot of people were, were happy about that. And, 
um, and the company had gotten really big and 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 um, and Hasbro did sort of introduce some uh, some better discipline uh, in in terms of you know what our schedules were uh, and that sort of thing. And people, I I think the the cash out was over two hundred and fifty dollars a share in the uh, in the end. So pe- people did make their money. I made plenty of money. Um, yeah. People were sad that they you know like it had gone from being a company in Peter's basement where everyone knew each other and and now it was part of a big East Coast company um, that you know did not necessarily understand things the way we understand them on the West Coast um, so that was an it was another shock but uh, it, it it helped people know what the future is right so that that was good yeah you had uh, some assurance like yeah that's right it's necessary for living yeah yeah it had it, like it had, it had landed right there was all this hope there was all this possibility and and okay now here's the final here's the realization um yeah. and and lots of people didn't like it and they had enough money to quit and so they quit and that was fine hmm. but the original magic artists um I believe for each piece of art, they got twenty-five dollars cash and twenty-five shares of stock. Oh, okay. So, oh. that's your your if you're if you're willing to make a full color portrait for a game company for twenty-five dollars, uh, you must believe that that stock is going to be worth something. And they were right; it was worth a lot. Yeah. And they got royalties as well. I got it. That's that's the okay. other thing. And so. Once magic took off, the magic artists were just making uh, huge amounts of money uh, on on royalties. That's great. So I um I, I had uh, I had the opportunity to be paid for some of my freelance work in stock. They owed me seven hundred and fifty dollars, and they said we can pay you in stock. And um, and I thought, oh, that's okay. I'll play along. I I might lose this money, but I'll play along. But my wife said, you know don't take the stock. We don't know what that'll be worth. And so I took the 750 in cash instead. And, uh, and at, know that, you know what, I think each piece of stock was worth a thousand over a thousand dollars in the end. So that would have been a, a million dollars if I had taken that in stock instead of in cash. Live and learn. Yeah, exactly. As uh, you do. <laughs> uh, so, uh, going back to Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. Uh, so, the edition was coming, because uh, you you guys were set on doing that. Yeah. Did you uh, were you involved from the beginning of that, or the the project no. was developing no. and then you jump in? So the the um, the folks from TSR were really sort of demoralized, right? Like they had they had seen their company going down. That they. Uh, <clears throat> the banks would not lend them money to print product. And if they couldn't print product, they couldn't make money to pay payroll or to pay off their debts or whatever. So they, they they were sunk and they had seen that coming for a long time. And, uh, and so for them, uh, being bought out was the ability to keep working on Dungeons and Dragons. They had to move across the country to do it. Um, and so, um, we, you know, we, we treated them really well. Um, they, they had this game uh, alternative that they wanted to produce, which was a terrible idea. And I told Peter it was a terrible idea. Um, we produced it anyway. You know, they wanted to do it. It was their big thing. It turned out to be a terrible idea. Um, and, uh, and they wanted to do uh, third edition with the, themselves and you know, most of the people on at Wizards who did game design were in cards. I was the um, the only one who had a lot of experience in, in role playing games, um, and so they were going to do uh, third edition sort of in house with, with just with the people who uh, had come from uh, come from TSR. Um, and so my initial project was to do some sort of um, crossover between Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons. So it could have been a version of Dungeons and Dragons that is based in magic. I tested that for a while and and um, 
Uh, it could have been a board game that used sort of D and D style mechanics, um, uh, but but was a, a you know a, a magic themed board game where you were you know closing portals and you could play a banalish hero or you know whatever white knight that sort of thing. Uh, and so I, I play tested a, a bunch of those things and none of them uh, uh, really came to fruition. Um, uh, and so it, it did take a while before I finally. Um, was uh, put on the third edition team. So they they came up with a draft of a new version of the rules that was, I mean, it just wasn't very good. People didn't like it, uh, and it didn't look like Dungeons and Dragons, and it didn't look better than Dungeons and Dragons, and and so uh, their first attempt was kind of rocky, and um, uh, and and Peter sort of. Um, managed to get me uh get me on the team thanks god yeah so, well uh... <laughs> I, I think it turned out well yeah <laughs> yeah yeah we can Fol that. following on that point you said that uh, this first draft if you may of a third yeah. edition was bad and quite different from what came to be so uh, can you give us uh, can you give us uh, an example of something that you remember that was quite different or at least uh, some discussions some yeah ideas? yeah sure the um so the uh the the core concept was you would roll a d20 and add a bonus and try to get 20 or higher as and then 20 if you got 20 or higher that would be a success um uh, and that's you sort of can do that with uh, with armor class, you know, like because armor class would go from high to, you know, low ar a bad armor was a high number right. back in Dungeons and Dragons, and so if you added armor class to your attack roll, you could use that as a, as a variable, uh, and try to hit a fixed, uh, target number, uh, and then there was a a big chart for, um, each class, uh, would have a chart for what level they are, like level one to 20, and what ability they're using, strength, dex, whatever. Um, and based on that, they would get a bonus. So maybe a, a third level fighter is plus six on strength rolls, but only plus one on uh, intelligence rolls, or that, that sort of thing. Um, and it, you know, you ended up looking at a, a big wall of numbers, uh, and right. it, it, didn't, it didn't feel right, and it wasn't organic, and, um, and it, it didn't it didn't look like D&D &D and it didn't seem it didn't it wasn't more streamlined than D&D. &D. Well, I mean, I, I guess it was maybe more unified, but it didn't use any of the rules that other games have developed that work like right, it, roll it, it a seems... die and add a bonus and try to get a difficulty number. Right. Like Ars Magica did or Cyberpunk yes. did that. And um, uh, and so that's what we ended up doing. But uh yeah, so you know, it was if you've never created a new role playing game before, it's really hard. Right. And it, I have it, created it... lots of new role playing <laughs> games, and even so, it's hard. And uh, how you, you talked about uh, how the game felt. Now it felt uh, dated, it felt clanky, perhaps. But how did it feel when you started really working on the third edition? How, how was the, the creative process behind? That when you actually started testing and developing and playing with the rules that came to be known as third edition D and D, yeah. how, how was that process? Uh, you know, once I think once we settled on the sort of the core system, you know, the the the, the D twenty system that people recognize. Um, then it was kind of golden because it was me and a bunch of other really smart people and people who knew D&D &D a lot better than I did, uh, trying new things and running play tests every week and writing stuff up. And, um, and, and our instruction from Peter was sort of uh, every rule change should be demonstrably better. And so if you can demonstrate that the new rule is better, then you can you can create a new rule, right? There's there was very little that we had to 
stick with. Like we had to stick with the six ability scores. You had to roll up the D20 to hit that sort of thing. Um, but we were, we were really given, um, other than that, a lot of, uh, yes, yeah. there we go. There we All go. right. Oh, <laughs> Sorry so, about that. No, 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 problem. no problem. The last thing, the last, the last thing we heard, uh, was that, uh, you said that you had a lot of uh, leeway, I, I yes. uh, suppose, uh, with what you, That's right. you could do. Yes. That's right. And so that was, that, that was really, that was wonderful. Um, you know, and we, you know, weapons used to do different damage, whether you were fighting someone medium size or larger than man size, like, you know, no other game copied that. And that's a pretty good uh, indication that it's a bad idea. And so, um, you know, we just got a lot of, get rid of a lot of stuff that, <coughs> that wasn't any good and um, made armor class make sense. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah. that's when, when you get rid of Taco. That's right. Yeah. yeah, but it's actually Thak Zero. That the 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 last character is a zero, not an O, because it's the hit armor class zero. So it's yeah. Thak Zero. <laughs> it sounds more epic. <laughs> Thak Zero. <laughs> yes, you like the name. That's my next character name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so you were working on this. It was like uh, ninety nine. 2000 when when did you hear when did you first heard about the original OGL license yes so it was um, in, the, in that time it was in that time so so thankfully uh, Ryan Dancy took over the creative direction for Dungeons and Dragons um, and uh, he he had a, a vision of uniting people around the Dungeons and Dragons experience. And so um, at that at that time when he took over, every time Wizards published an, an advanced Dungeons and Dragons book for sale, we lost money on it. And that's because each book had uh, a big brand name on it, like Ravenloft, Dark Sun, Forgotten Realms, uh, you know, Boy, it just goes on and on. Um, and uh, Spelljammer, right? Um, and then uh, and then there was also D&D, &D, which was separate. And you had Mastika and the Known World. And, and um, so what that meant is every product that we sold was only going to ever attract a small fraction of the gaming, the D&D &D playing audience. And the first thing uh, Ryan Dancy did when he was put in charge was strip those brands off so that we did a, you know, here's a monster book. And instead of being Ravenloft creatures of the night, it's advanced Dungeons and Dragons creatures of the night. And so it sold better, right? Yeah. So he, he knew what he was doing um, and he took it over from people who didn't know what they were doing. And that was the thing that killed advanced Dungeons and Dragons in the first place was splitting the market and splitting the market and splitting the market. Uh, and then trying to make more money by splitting the market again, right? Like, we'll come up with Dark Sun. It's this really big, cool, you know, everyone will want to play it. Well, but uh, everyone who plays it is now going to stop buying Spelljammer or Forgotten Realms or whatever it is that they were already playing. So that's one of the big things that killed D&D. &D, and he got rid of that. And then more than that, he wanted to... Um, uh, he, the, the whole process of point of the OGL was to get more people involved in the in the Dungeons and Dragons network. And when he first launched it, uh, told us about it, he didn't tell us that it was going to be for other companies to use. So he was like, "What? Let's come up with a logo uh, to show people that this uses the Dungeons and Dragons engine, the Dungeons and Dragons system, but it's not D and D." And I thought that was a great idea. Um, I like the first first time I bought uh, a TSR game that wasn't Dungeons and Dragons. That was Metamorphosis Alpha. I, I as a teenager, I was really angry that it did not use the D and D rules. It didn't use the D and D rules for combat. It didn't use the D and D rules for experience. Like what? I already know the D and D rules. They're great. Why? Why am I using a different rule set? So I loved the idea of doing, um, you know, more than one setting using the D&D &D rules. I thought it was all going to be in-house. In fact, um, 
when he took over, uh, I was working on a gamma world using D and D rules that we were going to produce. There was one of the many sub lines that AD and D had was the Odyssey line. Um, and it was sort of like a weird, anything goes alternate settings. And so I was going to do gamma world was old, old, uh, favorite of mine. And, um, and he killed that, rightly so, because his idea was we need to all we need to get people to be playing the same thing. We don't need people to be playing different things. Um, and then later we found out that the reason he wanted this D20 logo, that's what it ended up being, um, was not so that we in-house could create different games with the D&D rules, but that people outside the uh, company could do it. And lots of people didn't like that. Um, the guy who was running... Uh, role-playing games that you know that i was reporting to he didn't like it and his friends didn't like it um but uh in retrospect it was a fantastic idea yeah. and um uh and so you know he he sort of was cooking up his his project and sort of once it was baked and once he could he had something to show then we found out about it but it was um you know it was something handed to us and not everyone was on board with it yeah so um the last few weeks there was uh, this debate and uh, brian Lindsay has yeah. quite quite an ah. opinion about this that i'm going to ask <laughs> yeah. about uh, if the original ocl even if it doesn't say it is irrevocable so right. you were um, there uh, you talked with people, yeah. I guess you, you were uh, briefed yeah. on what the, the OCL was meant to do. In your opinion, yeah. Jonathan, was yeah. it meant to be irrevocable? It was meant to be irrevocable. In fact, w w Wizard said as much. It's like, you know, we're, w when, we, when we do this, then, then that, it's forever. This, you know, the, the license is binding on both parties. Um, it's it. And uh, yeah, the the idea that uh, that it could be taken away was explicitly denied. In fact, I think Wizards of the Coast used to say, if we ever come up with a new license, and maybe we will, nothing stops you from using the old license. Like right. That's the, the, the there's there's the license. Like it's yeah. binding on both parties. Actually, that was uh, written in the official page. Uh, Wizards of the Coast up until uh, uh, 2017, 19. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. They quietly <laughs> removed that, <laughs> but there right. are uh, <laughs> some that remember. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's right. Not, yeah, on the internet, uh, everything is forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, and uh, you know, my understanding is the new version of the uh, you know OGL will have a clause that says. The old version is hereby revoked or whatever, but, but whatever. Like that's if you don't sign that contract, you don't agree that it's revoked. Like it's, right. I, I I don't I don't know what difference that makes legally. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, the the big thing is um, TSR liked to sue other companies, and one of the companies they sued was Mayfair back in 1984, because Mayfair was doing. Um, supplements for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, and they said on the cover, suitable for use with Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, and then they said, you know, trademark owned by TSR, you know, used without authorization. But there are lots of knockoff products, right, consumer products that are made to mimic somebody, some big brand's product, and they even will talk, use that brand on their, uh, you know, on their uh, marketing on their packaging. So you might have a medicine that will say, you know, compare to Tylenol or, you know, but it doesn't say it is Tylenol or, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but it says Tylenol big in the yeah. center. <laughs> like, you cannot miss it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, uh, so TSR, TSR sued them, right? Because T TSR didn't want that to happen. And the suit went through, um, you know, with the court, the judge reviewed it. The judge was about to rule, oh, this is fine. Anybody can make a D and D adventure. Anyone can make a D and D supplement. Sure. And to prevent that from happening, TSR 
pulled the suit back. Uh, so it ne- there never was a ruling, and they made a special deal with Mayfair that Mayfair would have an official license to do all this, and then they could, you know, say officially license and 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 what have you. <clears throat> but if that judge had made that ruling, you wouldn't even need the OGL because anybody, could, whatever anybody can do that. And so, I I I I don't know what would happen if, if because there's no precedent. That's just that's this judge's opinion, uh, but there's there's every reason to think that if it went to court again, another judge would say the same thing. The, there's one thing um, you said that uh, Dancy, like he stopped this uh, this path of splitting and splitting and splitting the yeah. the brand, yeah. but the OGL uh, facilitates that other people it, uh, take, uh, that's, take a, that's an interesting that. point that is the, an interesting my point. question here is did the original ogl have any effect on the success of third edition uh, of third third edition yeah. <laughs> sorry yeah. uh, yes and i think it, like these two things must be connected <laughs> yes so it, it is uh it is true that the other companies would do uh maybe Uh, other game settings that in some ways competed, but mostly what they did was um, things that did not compete. They would do monster books or dungeons or the adventures or new classes or whatever for you to use in your regular D&D campaign. Not, you know, there were some uh, settings that were really different, but for the most part, those, those were not the biggest, um, uh, had the biggest effect. So in the year 2000, when third edition released, um, I went to Gen Con, that's the big game fair at, uh, in, in the United States. And all across the big convention hall, where you have all these people selling from their booths, all these other publishers, what they were mostly trying to do was to get you to stop playing Dungeons and Dragons and play their game instead. <laughs> and you play this game, play that game, play this other game, right? One year later, 2001 the OGL had come out and the D20 license had come out and now that same hall was full of publishers saying play more Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> with this product play more Dungeons and Dragons with this product right and so the so Ryan Dancy was completely right that the, he said the the main value of Dungeons and Dragons is that there are lots of other Dungeons and Dragons players you know right. if if some other role playing game had the number of players that Dungeons and Dragons have And then, then that would be the right game to play because you could always find players and there's lots of material for it and everyone knows how to play. I got uh, a feeling so, that homebrew is like in the heart of this <laughs> of this yeah. process and of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, and and more than anything before it, the, the OGL sort of reduced the barrier between the game master who's creating stuff for themselves and the and a game designer. Like it made it so much easier for you to get your material in front of other people because you could write in the lingua franca of role playing games. You could write in Dungeons and Dragons language and get your monsters or your dungeons or your whatever um, in, in front of other people. And so it had a huge effect and Dungeons and Dragons sold like crazy. And um, yeah, it, he, he was he was absolutely right. He got not just more people playing D&D, but more publishers trying to get you to play D&D. So, at this moment in, in time, D&D is amazing. Everyone is yeah. selling it, everyone is promoting it. Big but boom. then came fourth edition. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> What happened when Wizards <laughs> turned away from this, from this model to fourth edition? Yeah. So like I said, there were people who, um, people from TSR who still, you know, thought in the old, old fashioned way instead of the new fashioned way, like the 20th century business instead of 21st century business or, or Midwest business instead of West Coast business. And they did not like the OGL and they thought it was bad. Um, and then, um, Ryan had left the company. I don't remember exactly when, um, But now, um, 
the the person who didn't like the OGL and who hadn't been able to make Dungeons and Dragons work before now was in charge of Dungeons and Dragons again and um, and brought us fourth edition, including the new uh, game system license, which was going to be much more restrictive than the open game license. And so, so uh, you had Paizo, which was, uh, you know, owned by Lisa Stevens, loved D&D. They were doing D&D um, OGL material for, um, you know, have been doing that for years. We're the biggest fans of Dungeons and Dragons and promoting it and whatever. They suddenly switched, right? Like, well, we're not, you know, if if you, they were willing to get on board with fourth edition if there had been a license that they could know that the license was coming and know that the license was going to give them, you know, freedom, then they would have been on fourth edition and they would have been the biggest boosters out there trying to get people to play fourth edition. But because uh, because the license wasn't uh, forthcoming, because there were, they, there were delays and it wasn't, wasn't looking good, they said, screw it. We're just going to keep using the old open game license like Wizard says you can. If you come up with a new license, they'll just use the old license. And so now, now they did Pathfinder. And now they started uh, really competing with Dungeons & Dragons instead of promoting Dungeons & Dragons. And that's what happened when the people who didn't like the open gaming license tried to mess with it back in 2007. So at this moment in time, it, we see two things. A change in a license to a more restrictive license yeah. and an attempt to get into this uh, idea of the technological convergence. You know, there was this project called, of course, you know, it Glimax at the time. Yeah. <laughs> and this seems extremely similar to what we are going through right now. But yeah. how was uh, that other part, the part about the digital world? Uh, yeah. How did this idea come to be? How did you feel it from the inside? Were you there when, when this was uh, announced or, or were you fired before? How did it happen uh, when you were inside yeah. Wizards? Yeah, so... Um... So I was not on the on the fourth edition D and D team, uh, obviously, um, and uh, uh, and so I I was doing uh, new game development, and I ended up uh, on the Gleemax team, and it you know the 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 game designers in the R and D department, we were really big on. Um, you know, on the importance of gameplay and good game design. And and we sort of thought that we could launch from scratch this big platform where we would sell digital games online and digital game services. And then, then we take D&D &D online with fourth edition and we have a virtual tabletop. And um, but it's it's way harder to do digital products than anyone can imagine unless they've actually done a bunch of them and so our you know our goals were really these in retrospect were kind of fantastic kind of dream like like if this platform were successful it would have all these features you know it'd have its own currency or it'd have these algorithmically driven reviews and forums and you know it would have everything but we didn't we didn't know how to do it and no one knew how at that point we didn't know how to monetize the games that we wanted to do online so this was just before free to play games really picked up and so that changed everything and we we envisioned online games where like you would every time you want to play you know this this particular game you're like You'd have a uh, there was a, like a uh, a game where you built up your little goblin empire and fought other goblin empires on a big map and it was kind of cool and you played it a little at a time over you know days or weeks, but you would like pay four dollars every time that you wanted to play a new match of that game. Well, because we didn't know how you would monetize things like that. The answer is you do it 
on a huge scale and you do it free to play and then you find ways to monetize people and you make bank. That's that's but we didn't know. No one no one knew how to do that at that point. And so we had games that we weren't going to be able to make money on. The virtual tabletop for Dungeons and Dragons was just not it's kind of misbegotten. It's not really a good idea the way that it was uh, the, the way that it was set up. It was going to require a huge number of 3D assets that were going to, and every time a new D&D book was going to come out, you would need a huge number of new 3D assets in order to make the, the work. And then all these 3D assets that you put together are to make a static miniature of your character. They don't even, they don't breathe. And so you have huge amounts of effort to make a character that, that doesn't, in the end, doesn't look that good. And so, uh, you know, I didn't really see how, uh, none of us did, obviously, <clears throat> how misbegotten or, or cursed or, you know, wrongheaded the, the, the project was. Though in retrospect, it's like, oh, yeah, that, that probably wasn't going to work. Um, and, you know, I think it was we had a bunch of really smart people that wanted to do the next cool thing. And this seemed like the next cool thing. And we, we sort of gave it a try and it sort of never got off the ground. It wasn't the time we, we could say no, because all of that, like give it five more years. That's right. Seven? Yeah, that's right. It was that's right. 2008. I, I was that's thinking right. exactly that because the, the technology wasn't there to 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 to, yeah. to do it correctly or, or to do it massively, and, yeah, and not, not just right. the technology, the society uh, adapted right. to, to those that's right. things. This is just a personal that's opinion. Right. The, yes, name, the name the name the name was weird. <laughs> <Glimax is> weird. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. we we hired a consultant. We hired a consultant <laughs> to come in and help us with the name. Gleamex was the code name. And oh. We just used it as a code name because we we, we weren't even going to bother to come up with the real name until we hired these professional, highly paid consultants. They came in, talked for a long time, and the decision was, we're just going to call it Gleamex. <laughs> the place spoiler that came to be the name. <laughs> yeah, and and so and that's a, I think sort of an example of failure to really come to terms with what we were doing. <laughs> yeah. So then you have a few more minutes. I would like to ask yeah. you, yeah, uh, what do you, today, what yeah. do you think today about this whole debacle of, of OGL, the, this whole thing yeah. that's happening right now and the point yeah. that we are today, what do you think about the OGL discussed yeah. today? Yeah, well, I, you know, so back when we did fourth edition, the people in charge did not like the OGL and didn't understand it and thought it was bad and that they created a mess. And now today, I think you have the same thing where you have people who don't understand what's what really is going on in the market and they don't like it. And they are once again, they're making a huge mess. And that was after fifth edition really made it easy for people to create uh, material. And they could even said, go ahead and call it 5E. Like, we don't have a trademark on 5E, so you can make 5E material, no problem. So uh, I don't know where that mess is going to end up. Um, I, 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 I think it's going to uh, hurt Dungeons and Dragons, and I think it's going to hurt a, a lot of publishers like I'm working on uh, second edition for 13th age and 13th age is sort of Rob Hanso and I, he was the lead designer on fourth edition. We're best friends. This is the version of D and D that we want to play. So it's, you know, more narrative oriented, kind of like Ars Magica was more narrative oriented and it's more free form, kind of like over the edge is more free form. And, um, uh, and so it's a real hassle to have to not know exactly uh, what's up. And all all across the industry, people who had been, you know, planning and working and whatever, we all, we have to spend our time scrolling and thinking and reading and talking, and it's it's, it's a it's a huge distraction. And and 
you know, it's hard to predict what will happen, but I, I think, um, I think it means things will kind of bust loose. I think that wizards will end up having less control, sort of. I think, um, I think it's going to prove impossible to regain control over the creative people who are trying to use the system and when we're going to keep using it one way or another and it's just going to cause a lot of bad blood and hard feelings and uh wasted time and lawyers time so yeah i don't i don't know it um it did sort of look like dungeons and dragons had the lock on role-playing games in a way that they didn't before in the 90s they were the biggest role-playing game but there were other really big role-playing games that people played um, and now they've sort of spoiled their position you know um, and I don't know what's going to come of it but I don't think it's going to be uh, good for wizards so, so I was about to ask you about that it, like uh, the, the question is um, where do you see the hobby in the following years you, you sort of answered that already but uh, how do you see the future for all the independence publishers? Like, like the, the one that they, they are starting right now uh, with this debacle or not? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think a lot of people are going to back off of their uh, OGL products because they don't know what's going to happen. Like, like, even if you would win in court, you don't want to get taken to court. Yeah. And um, so it's so, you know, if what they want to do is have fewer people using the OGL, maybe they have succeeded at least for a while. Right. Like a lot of people are going to stop doing the project that they were going to be working on because they don't know what the future holds. Um, and and and. Yeah, we'll see. I'm sort of interested in sort of the ORC license that Paizo and others are working on. And um, I know Wolf Bauer at uh, Cobalt Press is onto something. He's he's one of the people that got laid off back in uh, 95. I hired him to come work at Wizards uh, along with uh, three other designers. And um, so uh, he's been doing uh, great stuff with Cobalt Press and I'll be really curious to see uh, what he comes up with. It, it's, uh, you know, a lot of it depends on what other people than me decide. What did the people at Paizo decide to do? What does Wolf Bauer at Cobalt Press decide to do? What do the lawyers at Wizards decide to do? Like, I don't have any control over that or really insight. So I'm, I'm wondering, just like anybody, my, my guess is people will learn that you kind of don't even need an OGL in order to knock off Dungeons and Dragons products. You can just do it. So, um, but, but we'll see. Yeah. It's like right now, right now we are in the eye of the tornado. Like yeah, it's, that's right. it's hard to see forward, but we heard in an, in an interview of yours that you knew, uh, back then, uh, with D&D 3.0, that that was a, uh, a point of inflection in RPG yeah. design. Yeah. You were playing B. That, that's what I understood from your interview. In your opinion, yeah. was there another big shift after that upon, up until this day? Yeah, the, so the big shift, I think, is uh, streaming. I think the the ability for people to watch people playing Dungeons and Dragons online is uh, sort of changed everything. So some of that is like people watch streaming shows like Critical Role or, you know, like that. And, and so that's a whole new sort of industry. But more than that, it became possible for people to find out how to play D&D &D without having to ask someone to teach them how to play D&D. &D. If people would ask me, like, how do you play this game? It's like, I, how do you, it's hard to explain. Like, I, it's, it's easy if you sit down at a table and people lead you through it. It's easy, right? Like, you open the door and you see a giant two-headed snake spitting fire. What do you do? Like, I mean, everyone, you can do that. Everyone can make, decide what their character does. But, um, 
but explaining how that works uh, because it's so different from what other other forms of entertainment was was always really difficult and now it's a breeze right so um, I think that was the big inflection point and that's not really in game design uh, that's in um, uh, sort of the everything that sort of comes around it. I like a lot of what 5th edition did, and I kind of uh, ad- admire it. Um, I think with 3rd edition, we were coming from the advanced Dungeons and Dragons, where, you know, things were pretty complicated and detailed, and we we wanted to respect that. And 5th edition is a lot more like the Dungeons and Dragons game that was not advanced Dungeons and Dragons, but basic Dungeons and Dragons. And, you know, I always... Re- liked the basic version of Dungeons and Dragons more than the advanced version myself, just because it was more straightforward. Yeah. You you didn't have different types of damage depending on how big the monster was that you were swinging at. It, it made more sense. And so fifth edition does some, some, uh, some nice things. Yeah. So Jonathan, what are you working on right now? Besides yeah. almost, almost killing Rob with mutant green dragons in the playbook. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what are right. you working on right now? What projects are you uh, in? Uh, we read a, a little about Grandmother Fish. You can also talk about that. And right. uh, where can people find more about what you're doing too? Yeah, so um, I'm easy to find on Twitter um, at um, Jonathan M as in Michael tweet. Uh, and um, you mentioned Grandmother Fish. I do a, a Grandmother Fish account on Twitter, too. That is the first book to teach evolution to preschoolers. And so while I was working on third edition, I was also working on this book for my little daughter. Um, I wanted her to have a book like this, and there, there wasn't one on the market. Um, and it, it took me 15 years to really figure out how to make it work. And, and by that time, Kickstarter had come along. And so I could raise funds for this on my own and self-publish it in a way that I wouldn't have been able to do um, if I had figured out how to make the book work uh, earlier. Um, So that was a big success. We sold out of our little print run and Macmillan picked it up. And now uh, the book is in Italian and Chinese and Japanese. And um, so so that was a a really nice project um, to sort of become real for me. And the artist and I are talking about another book we want to do we've got a couple ideas and we're sort of zeroing in on one now um so we'll see if i i can do that uh anytime soon um i really like the game world glorantha which is the world that runequest was based in or um hero quest uh robin laws uh sort of free form fantasy game uh so glorantha is a a mythic fantasy setting created by uh a shaman anthropologist and so um each uh like each race or each uh culture tells the story of the world from their own perspective and the same events are retold but from different perspective each time and there's there's no you know there's no ultimate uh neutral point from which you can assess everything it's like you're just in the mix of this world and maybe the trolls are right or maybe the dragon newts are right or maybe the dwarves are right no no one knows and uh, I love that kind of thing. And um, I was a big fan of this world um, as a teenager. It really taught me a lot about how to, how to create fantasy worlds and how to connect your fantasy character to the fantasy world that you're in. So in 13th Age, every character has a connection to the icons who are sort of the, the, um, the behind the scenes uh, characters that that sort of run the uh, world. So the, the emperor and the archmage and the diabolist and the lich king and the high druid and, and, and the players are all connected in some way to these, to these uh, powerful, these beings, these powerful beings. And I basically stole that from Glorantha where everyone is connected to a deity or a religion and that uh, influences their point of view and their powers and how people relate to them. So Glorantha is a, really big part of my uh, gaming history and I've got a book coming out um, called Dragon's Eye that is about um, um, sort of my take on uh, the major setting in uh, Glorantha where um, for each setting like for this city or for this holy spot or for these ruins 
uh, I have three different versions of what players find there so that there's no one um, by the book way that you do anything. Everything is uh, you as the game master have to figure out what's real for your campaign. And, um, and so that's in the, that's in the bag and they're uh, producing it. And now I'm working on a second project in that same world with a, a similar theme, but um, this time it's from the point of view of the enemies, the, you know, the people who have been the, the enemies of the good guys ever since the, you know, game launched in the seventies. And now you're going to play the bad guys or are they the bad guys? Um, <laughs> and so that's, that's a ton of fun. And um, uh, that's my uh, big new game project. I have a, a an unannounced, um, game project uh that um is being slow to uh slow to become real but i um it was the a pretty big project that i worked on uh a couple of years ago and i'm waiting for the publisher to get the art and the, everything together i think it's going to be really interesting um but i yeah i've got it i've got a lot of uh, opportunities now i'm sort of a at the point where I'm picking my projects uh, based on what I want to do. There's a big project I might want to do with um, uh, Cobalt Press and Wolf that we talked about before the pandemic, and then the pandemic hit and everyone's plans were shot. Um, so maybe we'll pick that up again. Um, but it, but who knows what he's doing now with the new OGL? So it's a uh, it's a big question mark. The big thing now is uh, 13th Age Second Edition, where you know 10 years ago uh, we came out with this you know narrative oriented. Uh, exciting combat version of Dungeons and Dragons and um, and now we get to use everything we've learned in the last 10 years to come back to that uh, original game and and sort of retool it and fix some of the numbers and uh, sort of increase the the level of uh, player authority and narrative control that the uh, game master has and, and sort of uh, amp it up so that's that's really rewarding so that's a lot of projects Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Great. And um, first of all, uh, we want to thank you, Jonathan, for, for this interview. Yes, thank uh, you. Thank we, you learned, we learned a lot. I think I can speak for all of the team. Uh, it was really interesting. And we will be paying attention to the announcements that uh, Jonathan Tweet makes on Twitter. <laughs> so we find out That's when right. all of your projects uh, come. So. Thank you from all of our projects, and uh, we'll be hearing yeah. more from you in the future, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very, very much. That's a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Well.